Our speaker this morning is Zach Hill, a native of North Carolina. Zach graduated in botany at North Carolina State University in 2008 and then moved to Texas from which he made many uh, plant hunting trips to northern Mexico. He came back to North Carolina in 2010 and has been working with Tony Avent at Plant Delights Nursery and Juniper Level Botanic Garden since then. He is currently the plant records specialist and taxonomist for the nursery and the garden. While back in North Carolina, Zach has made many collecting trips with Tony and others, uh, primarily in the Southeast. And on these trips, he's seen thousands of plants, both in their natural habitat and in botanical gardens and in private homes. Zach has discovered many new species of plants, some of which remain to be published and uh, given him credit for. Uh, his interests include trilliums, aspidistras, agaves, sedges, and well, most plants in general. <laughs> he is here today to talk about some unique and rare plants that he's seen in his travels, particularly in the Southeast. So please welcome Zach Hill. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Bobby, for that introduction. Uh, so we're gonna look at some plants from the Southeast. So my first introduction to plants was in about 1996, was with Trillium cuneatum, uh, in Davidson County, North Carolina, at my grandmother's uh, property. Unfortunately, I picked one and also picked Sanguinaria canadensis at the time, thinking it was a small trillium, uh, and then learned later that I really should not have done that. This was the uh, plant that started my journey into plants and was really the gateway um, into the madness that's been the, pa the past about 30 years or so. So, so thinking about trilliums and things for the first little bit, the trillium pusillum complex is a fairly rare um, complex of trilliums. Uh, here is the, uh, the typic species um, native to the coastal plain of the Carolinas. It's a pedicillate species that has about an inch or so uh, pedicel. Um, I've seen it in Pender County and it was growing in this lo low flat woodland on these little hummocks of moss. And this is uh, Trillium pusillum variety four. Um, Susan Farmer was calling it um, variety Carolinianum. It's probably gonna be elevated. You can see some little white bits on the hummocks, which are this same species. It's a almost sessile species that has a very short pedicel. It was, that's what everybody thought that the material here in Raleigh uh, and in Middlesex, um, in Nash County, Johnston County, was Trillium pusillum variety pusillum, which is the one we had seen prior to this. Uh, in the spring of 2024, Al uh, Alice Zawadzki, Donna Wright, and I went on a really wet, rainy afternoon to Yates Mill Pond, where a population had been known from. The population had been thought to be extinct uh, because a beaver had built a dam on the creek that flows into Yates, well, I guess it you know, flows into um, Lake Wheeler, uh, but it actually made better habitat when we got there and found out that they really did like the, the extra moisture that the flooding of the swamp forest had created. Um, Susan Farmer, the Trillium researcher was there that morning, we were there that afternoon. We both found the plants and we're like, wow, this is not Pusillum variety. Pusillum, this is Pusillum variety, well, Virginianum at the time because they thought all the, the sessile Pusillums were all the same, but it turns out there's about four taxa that are in that. Um, on the left here is Trillium Pusillum variety one. This is the Alabama least Trillium. It's also found in low, wet, boggy habitat. Um, in the northeast corner of Alabama, uh, like Jackson County. 
where it grows with Trillium sessile and Trillium staminium. The right-hand plant is Trillium georgianum. This was elevated very recently within the past five or six years. It's a single site endemic to Whitfield County, Georgia. Uh, unfortunately, most of its habitat has been destroyed because it's adjacent to a like a trunking company or something and they built a big warehouse right by it. So this is a picture of it at uh, Juniper level. It clumps up really nicely in the garden and it, it does quite well in average garden soil. And then, then we come to an even rarer taxa that has still not been published. This is um, Trillium Pusillum variety three at the moment. This is from Aiken County, South Carolina. It grows on the Savannah River site, nuclear power plant land. Mm -hmm. um, these are all, well, the, the upper corner is uh, Patrick McMillan's picture from the wild, but in about 2010, Patrick McMillan got permission to go visit the site with some botanists at the state of South Carolina. He got there, there were about a dozen plants in the population and there was evidence of wild hog damage. So with permission, Patrick dug three plants to take some to South Carolina Botanic Garden and gave Tony one plant uh, to safeguard as well, just to have it in case the hogs decided that they wanted to finish off the meal with this undescribed very rare taxa. Um, the plants at South Carolina were stolen uh, fairly quickly afterwards. Uh, and we have probably the only remaining plant in cultivation at the moment. We're working to get it multiplied. But the he went back in the spring of 22, I believe, and saw about half a dozen plants in the population, or and most of them were not flowering size. This one's quite interesting actually, because when it flowers, after it flowers, when it fruits, you go to back to look for the fruit and it face plants its capsule right into the soil surface, uh, according to Susan Farmer. So it's quite hard to find it in fruit. Um, the, the other member of the, the pedicillate group in this is a Trillium texanum. This one has generally five veins per leaf and this is from like Eastern, uh, Western Louisiana and Eastern Texas. And it's proven quite easy to grow in the garden. So last spring, Tony, Patrick and Adam Black and I went uh, on a short trip up to the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, this is a peach orchard branch. This is a good spot to see um, the Pacassandra percumbens in the wild. It's I've seen it in Alabama and South Carolina. I've never seen it in the one or two spots in North Carolina it occurs in, but it was quite amazing to see the diversity in this fairly rare and localized species of Pachysandra that's a wonderful garden plant. Uh, it's blooming right now at uh, work and it smells um, very spicy in flower. It's a cinnamony smell. Um, and here it is, here's a bank of it um, along a small branch there. It was a very wonderful day to be in the field. It was um, in the 40s and raining most of the day. So we were definitely not dry most of that day. But um, if you look down at the base of this Aeschylus, the tree that's in the middle, you can see that there's a small, oh, wrong, wrong one. Where's the... There's a plant here, and then there's a trillium sort of in the middle of the screen towards the bottom, for those of you at home that couldn't see me showing the laser pointer. Um, it's trillium discolor is throughout this site, um, the pale yellow toad shade. Uh, it's a Savannah River endemic, a Savannah River basin endemic, um, barely found in North Carolina, just like the Pachysandra. It's, it's a plant I first met in probably 2002 at uh, the Winston-Salem Garden of Emily Allen, who was this wonderfully sweet 
lady, um, if she liked you. Um, <laughs> and she would give you things if she liked you. Um, but she had a really nice population of this that she had planted um, on her garden um, across the creek. And she was influential in me learning about trilliums. I've seen a lot of species only in her garden until the past 10 to 15 years when I've actually been able to go to the, the wild to see them. Uh, and then on the right is Collinsonia verticillata, a world horse balm. It's a spring blooming perennial mint um, from the, the coastal plain and uplands of South Carolina down into Georgia. It's very short. Most Collinsonias are above waist high and bloom in the fall. This one is, if it hits a foot, it's amazing. Um, but it's a nice spring ephemeral bloomer that grows with the Trillium discolor here at the same site. Um, um, so Patrick McMillan got me into sedges. Um, it's a slippery slope. Um, this is a really nice garden plant. This is Carex austro that's also at the same site. It's a great replacement for Liriopes and Ophiopogons. It's fully evergreen. It doesn't get more than about six to eight inches high. It blooms very early in the spring. It was starting to spike last week in the garden at work. Uh, it, it was, it's completely evergreen. They looked great. The, the one in the bottom right is in the wild and the one in the left is at work, uh, but that's after it's had a little haircut, but the one in the, from the wild looks perfect after a full winter without any issues at all. And another Carex, this is Carex Radfordi, named after Al Radford, who wrote the flora of the Southeast before Alan Weekly got his mitts on it and turned it into the flora of the, the world, basically. Um, this is a really nice, blue sedge. It's a little bigger than Ostracurliniana. Uh, you can see Patrick here on the right holding up a leaf. It's about uh, 18 inches high. Obviously, it was a real nice day in the field. Patrick is soaked. Um, but this, this plant has proven to be very adaptable in the garden as well. Also here is a really interesting um, Solidago, Solidago falsibus, the gorge goldenrod. Uh, in the wild, it's the upper left and the right hand side. Uh, it doesn't bloom often. It grows in the woods. It's got huge leaves. And of course, you know, Patrick said, oh, it doesn't bloom much. So the divisions we brought back to Juniper level decided that uh, they were all going to bloom uh, the same year um, as we got them from last spring. This is a very interesting goldenrod. It is a decaploid. It has 10 sets of chromosomes. It's native to the upstate of South Carolina, as well as a population in Western Virginia. Um, the guys that have done all the description on this say it's the same. Patrick and I don't really agree. This one is a decaploid version of um, Solidago vazii. And the one in Virginia is actually a decaploid of a different taxa of Solidago, but they both had this weird mutation that their chromosomes got really huge. Um, it's a fairly large flower for a goldenrod. Um, the rhizomes can travel up to 30 feet over their lifetime. It's not, it's, no, it's not scary. It's like 10 feet a year, but it's one little single, little single rosette. Um, but Patrick has traced them back when he was doing herbarium specimens in the upstate South Carolina. And you could see that it had grown eight to 10 inches every year. So that plant had moved 30 feet over God knows how long. So most of you are probably familiar with our native Piedmont Esculus sylvatica. Um, it's a nice small shrub. It should be blooming in the next month or so. It's all around Chapel Hill and in the central Piedmont. Most of the places, it's this greenish color, except in the upstate of South Carolina, which is, this is at Glassy Mountain Preserve in Pickens County. Over the eons, um, ruby-throated hummingbirds on their migrations have stopped 
along the coastal plain and visited Aeschylus pavia, which is the red buckeye that is a coastal plain species. Over, over that, that time, on their migration, they moved some pollen up into these populations. These, these plants are almost completely Aeschylus sylvatica, except for one gene that turns it red in flower. It also does this with the other Aeschylus, the Aeschylus flava in upstate South Carolina, which is normally yellow in a large tree. They are red flowered as well. These are also very short, um, knee high and full bloom. This, it's, it's an amazing plant. It should be in cultivation. Uh, we're working to get seeds. We were trying to get them last year from this population. Uh, it's growing with um, Pacara obovata, a nice, it's running a little bit in the garden. Pro Tony's probably not gonna keep it because it's not got good manners right now. Um, but it's, that's the yellow that's in there with it um, on the side of Glassy Mountain. And this is the view it has. It's, it grows on the, it's also on these uh, exposed rocks with uh, yucca flaccida. It's got a great view, but the plant behind it has an even better view. Packer millifolium. It's a very rare um, senecio, what used to be a senecio, with tansy-like leaves. This is um, this is Patrick's picture from upstate, uh, but they were behind us where we were looking out over that um, the view there. We're growing some of these at work, um, but unfortunately, most of the ones we have are not pure. They have Pacra anonima in them, so that turns them into a different hybrid taxa and they're running a little bit too much. Also in upstate South Carolina, we visited, um, this is Boggs Rock. It's a large, it's one of the largest rock out, flat, granitic flat rock outcrops I've ever been to. Um, we have some here in Raleigh, uh, up near Zebulon, the Rocks Preserve and Temple Flat Rock. Uh, it's got these, uh, depression, um, uh, little depressions in the granite that, that collect uh, sand over the years. And it's got this diamorpha smallii. It's a winter annual. Um, it's a pretty little thing with little four petal flowers. It's about two to three inches high in bloom. It carpets these rocks. It, they come up really early in the spring or late fall, and then are dead by May. But it's a great little native plant. This was last Saturday at the Rocks Preserve. You can see the little seedlings in the gravel. Um, they're, they're barely visible, but some of them were up high and then some were just tiny little things. Also, uh, Patrick took us to see Shortia galacifolia, Oconee bells in the wild up there. Uh, I had seen it in gardens, but I had never actually seen it in the wild. Unfortunately, we were about two to three weeks past bloom with it here. Here, it's it's climbing the trees, and it was hard to walk at the site without stepping all over these huge mats of Oconee bells. And here's uh, it was covering this rock. And it's just, it was hard to walk. I can't imagine seeing it in bloom in the spring. Um, I'd love to go back and see it. But you can also see it's got some seedling recruitment on the rock itself. They seem to like to seed right onto the granite and in the moss. So it was amazing. This, this plant was found in the late 1700s, collected, pressed, was forgotten about. Nobody knew what it was. Um, there was a kid in upstate South Carolina, I believe, who found it in bloom. He was collecting herbs um, to sell and scent. And it's like, what is this plant that's blooming? And then it was described about 50 to 60 years after it was first collected. And then that one turned out to not be Galacifolia, but Brevastyla, which is a different species. We actually have two taxa in the south, southern Appalachians. So here is the parkway. Um, this is heading up towards, I've got land um, in Jackson County, but this is heading down 
towards Devil's Courthouse. We were up there in May to see the, well, not to see that, but we saw rhododendron vasii in bloom. It's a North Carolina endemic rhododendron that blooms um, in late April to early May. Uh, and it's usually above about 4,500 feet, but it is an absolutely stunning plant in the wild. This It's between graveyard fields and um, Devil's Courthouse. It's just absolutely covered with these plants. They also grow with some hanging bogs. You can see um, Parnassia grandifolia and Trout Viteria carolinensis up near the top and uh, some solidagos and there's some rare um, hypericums that grow here. It's almost completely saturated year round. Uh, in the winter, it forms these amazing um, icicles. It's one of the reasons they have to shut some of the parkway down because it flows across the road and you really can't drive across it. And also um, Micranthes petiolaris, variety petiolaris, what used to be um, um, Saxifraga michoii, um, was growing up there on the rocks as well. It's some really nice rock outcroppings. Obviously, this was not a native habitat originally since they had to blast the rock um, to get the road in, but you know, the plants seem to, to thrive in this, this sort of habitat. And there's the Parnassia in bloom. I've not gotten to see this one in bloom in the wild, but uh, Patrick's picture is quite stunning. So this is also about 5,000 feet uh, in spring. And at this, this altitude, you get a lot of um, trillium, or erectum and grandiflorum that grow in the high mountain forests. Uh, it's like a uh, red oak um, forest with some beach and lots of grassy things. But then you get trillium erectum forma album and trillium grandiflorum and Trillium erectum that are all up there. These are all pedicillate species that bloom up there in the wild about late April, early May. It blooms for us down here late March, early April. Uh, we can grow some of them. They're not great unless you get some that are more heat tolerant. We've got a form um, from George Ubelhart from Germany that we're calling gorgeous that actually does do well in the Southeast that we will have eventually. Um, Patrick McMillan took us up to Dalton Park, out of the parkway in Sparta, in, on the 4th of July of 22. And he said, you've got to see this site. It's got so much Asclepius tuberosa in it, you won't believe it. And later in the season, it's covered in Liatris um, spicata. And it's just the diversity, there's reddish orange, orange, yellows, all manner of variation. And it's just this high elevation meadow, sort of bald type habitat. Um, and it's growing with the uh, Pycnanthum amuticum, which is not necessarily a great garden plant unless you have lots of space for it to run. Uh, it'll go about 20 feet in a year from a one quart I've found. Um, but it's, it's a great pollinator plant. If you've got the right spot for it, it's a great plant. But here's what it looks like in late July, early August. This is a native population of Lytra spicata. Uh, Prairie, uh, Blazing Star is a common name for it. Um, but this, this habitat has probably been grassy like this for, I don't know, the past 10, 15,000 years. It, it appears to be a natural bald or a bald type habitat. Also up there, there's some variation within another thuggy, but really great plant, um, Asclepia syriaca. Common milkweed, they had white form, white flowered forms, as well as these really gorgeous purple leafed forms with the normal flower color. Um, th these were growing side by side. We don't really know why they're doing what they're doing, but unfortunately it's in the national park on the parkway, so they're still there. Um, we also found a new population of Caminarian angustifolium fireweed. I know that's it's a pretty common plant for those of you who have seen it 
uh, up in Canada or the Rockies. It's not very common down here. Um, but this was a really nice population of this circumboreal species of um, plant. Uh, it's, it used to be epilobium, um, but it's now in this nice, fun Caminarian genus. So about 10 years ago, 10, 8 or 10 years ago, uh, Mark Rose um, found this weird-looking SRM up in Caldwell County. It looks very, very much like Galax. And it grows with um, Asarum or Hexastylus uh, shuttleworthy eye. And you would think, oh, it's just going to be a green form at first. Well, until it blooms and it's got these amazing white flowers with this deep purple eye. And unfortunately, I've not seen this in the wild. We've grown this for a while from uh, Mark as well. It, it performs all right down here. It really would like to be up against some sort of camellia or under a ilex opaca something with that has a lot of acidic duff that, that keeps it cool in the summer um, and another really neat rock garden type plant that's proven to be very difficult in cultivation is the sucra parvifolia variety sorensis it's a it's native up on pilot mountain and hanging rock in the Saratown mountains uh, north of winston-salem it grows under these ledges, so it never really gets much water that actually hits these plants. They're, it's a little tiny heuchera. Um, it gets maybe six inches tall, um, but it just carpets the ground along the pinnacle there at um, Pilot Mountain and on some of the rock outcroppings up on Hanging Rock. But unfortunately, not very easy to grow, um, not in cultivation much if i if at all at this point um but it's a great plant to go see in the wild um it's in full riotous bloom as robert uh mcintosh would say uh, but it, it's a neat little oddity in heuchera so in 2017 uh, jeremy schmidt and i were on a trillium looking looking trip in georgia and south carolina um, we stopped in Burke County at this site that looked interesting. It was the, the, like a cypress swamp sort of habitat. And, you know, we went in the woods and it was mucky and wet and was covered in Dryopteris ludovisiana, waist high. There were tens of thousands of plants at this site. And this, this trout vateria was there. So lots of it and you know we said oh well, we'll get a division off of this and see what it does back in north carolina back at home in the garden and it turned out to be a really great plant we normally kill trout vateria because it's really cold it likes it cold um, but this particular species nervada um, tony named it swamp queen from its habitat um, it it has thrived in the seepages in the crevice garden along the creeks and full sun, I've got it in a raised bog planter at my house. Um, it blooms perfectly in June and July, sets good seed. Here it is in the wild on the left. Unfortunately, we were there in March of 17. By November of 17, they had clear cut the whole thing. Uh, we were looking on Google Earth and we said, oh, crap. They and you know you could see that they had clear cut it. So we went back down there again in eighteen, got a few more plants that were still there, but all of the ferns that were there were gone. I mean, it was the most amazing. You could smell the ferns in the air. It was the most magical spot, one of the most magical spots in Georgia I've ever been. Uh, it's my background on my computer screens at work because it's so pretty, and I kind of hate it's gone. So back to Trillium cuneatum. This is stuff in Montgomery County. We've got normal red flowered Little Sweet Betsy on the left and a nice yellow form on the right. I'm bringing this back up because Trillium cuneatum is not really a good species, but actually a complex of species. It's actually probably about seven species. Um, this is what would be the typical material, which was the type stuff Although 
there's some confusion about what the type was because Raffinesque didn't really have. Uh, there, we couldn't find any specimens of it, so a specimen was denoted from uh, Buncombe County, which is not where Raffinesque was collecting. He was collecting in Kentucky and Tennessee. So Patrick and I, we might be uh, screwing with the names on this eventually. This might go back to Trillium um, Hugeri. Or UGI if you're from the low country of South Carolina with the um, Huguenots. But in uh, along the Savannah River in um, Georgia and a little bit into South Carolina along um, the Rocky River, this is this is this would be Trillium cuneatum according to all the maps. This is definitely not cuneatum. It's much earlier, narrow petals. Normal cuneatum that I grew up with uh, smells like juicy fruit bubblegum. It's really sweet, fruity. This is very yeasty and not so nice. Um, this is going to be something new. Um, it's also growing, if you see the middle picture, uh, with Fraser uh, Carolinian, carolinensis, uh, which we thought when we first walked up on it was going to be uh, Dodecatheon or Primula media um, shooting star. Uh, turns out this is not. This is a really good population of Frasera carolinensis, American columbo. It's a um, gentian that acts like an agave, basically. It's um, a big monocarpic plant. It forms this giant root until it decides that, oh, I've got enough energy and sends up this giant spike that um, with these four petaled green flowers and then set seed and promptly dies. So it, it's a really rare, uh, really likes calcium, which showed us that the site was a little different soil geography wise, but um, also in the area was Obelaria virginica which is not really cultivatable from what I've found. If any of you have grown it from rescues, it doesn't usually take. Um, if you have it, enjoy it. It's a, another gentian that's up shortly. Uh, it's about four to six inches high, um, but it's really hard to see in the leaf litter in the spring. But it's a great little native plant. I wish we could grow it, but it probably has a fungal alliance that is hard to to grow and does not transplant. This species, this is Trillium radiatum. This was also a cuneatum. Uh, Sensu Freeman, and Freeman even said in his paper in the 70s, uh, Trillium cuneatum is a lumping, lumping ground for everything that fits this sort of description. Uh, this is Trillium radiatum. Uh, Jane Lampley from Tennessee split it out in 22 via molecular and um, Morphological data. This is um, from Northwest Georgia, Northeast Alabama, and Southeast Tennessee. It's got really scabrous stems at the top. You can feel it's rough, um, and it's yellow to per to the purple, and it's sort of fetid smelling. It doesn't smell at all like cuneatum should. It's it's a great garden plant, um, but uh, on the right is it in situ with a yellow form at um, in St. Clair County at uh, Camp Sumatonga, which is one of the locations that it's found in. Also in Northeast Alabama, we found um, Camassia saloides, which is it's native in North Carolina and a few spots up near Roanoke Rapids, uh, where it grows in floodplains with Trillium sesley. This is um, on some upland slopes in Jackson County, Alabama. This was taken from the car. There was no real good place to stop and get up there to get good close-ups. Um, was a fly-by-night going up to the Tennessee state line to look at Trillium. Also, in a spot we stopped there, the shrub scrambling through the trees is a really rare plant. This is Nevusia alabamensis, Alabama snow wreath. Um, limited in distribution, but a great garden plant if you've got space for it. It blooms in spring with these white apetalous flowers that are just nothing but stamens. But it's really easy to grow. It does run a little bit, but um, it's a it's a really cool plant. Um, but Georgia, uh, I think it's Georgia, 
Alabama and Tennessee. So you're walking through the woods and you would see this leaf and you would probably think, oh, this is just going to be this little brown jugs, Hexastylus aerifolia. Uh, this is this is in um, up near Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, this actually, once it bloomed, was not aerifolium. This is a Sarum finzeli, which was described in 2020. It's related to Sarum speciosum in the newly published uh, species from down near Mobile. Um, that was another weirdo, but this is what it looks like in the garden blooming. Um, it's a two site, currently endemic, um, but Brian Keener published it in 22. Uh, we went to go see it, or in 2020, we went to see it that same spring and found what we thought might be a new population, but um, in talking to Brian, it was the same second population he had found. It's a great garden plant. It's clumps up, the foliage turns nice and blackish bronze in the winter. Uh, and then it's got these really weird flowers in the spring. So another great vine we're growing is this Apios priciana. It's a really rare and restricted species to Northwest Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Kentucky. It's, it's a restricted species, uh, but grows very similar to the, the upper left, the uh, Apios americana, the common ground nut, which is everywhere around here. Uh, they're both technically edible rooted species. Uh, I wouldn't suggest eating Apios priciana. It's not, um, doesn't grow nearly fast enough for it to be profitable to eat such a thing. Uh, this is uh, Carex picta, boot sedge. Uh, the one on the right is a selection, a male selection I did, I got from Alabama in 2013. We're offering it this spring after many years of trying to keep it alive in a pot. It's an ever, it's a beautiful evergreen weeping sedge. Uh, it looks very much like Oshimensis, only it's native. It's, it's dioecious. It has male and female plants on, and they're, they're different, but they form these nice ground cover mats where they're growing with trillium decumbens along creeks. So 2014, I got a chance to go, go to Alabama in the summer. And normally I did trips in spring for trilliums, but it turned out I could go to see this, the Kathy Stiles Freeland Bibb County Glades. Uh, it's a really neat, really horribly hot <laughs> in August habitat to go visit. You can see um, Silphium glutinosum growing up here right at the entrance. It's also along the creek. This is a single county endemic, uh, Silphium. Uh, named for the glandular hairs on pretty much the entire plant. Uh, we found it to flop in rich soil, but if you plant it where it's more sterile, it gets about three feet high and is a great pollinator plant um, and it doesn't run. Um, this site had more seed ticks than just about any place I've ever been. Uh, it also has this really neat uh, Spigelia, Spigelia albumensis, Alabama pink root growing on the glades themselves. There's a lot of endemics here, um, Cahaba, um, Dahlia, there's a little um, pea that's native there and uh, creeping Coreopsis, uh, Grandiflora inclinata that's there, but it's just got lots of really limited species that are only found on the glades. It's a dolomitic lime glade. Uh, it's very, it's a very interesting site and very miserable in the summer. Uh, also on that trip, uh, Hayes Jackson took us to a site outside of Anniston where he said, oh, there's Clinopodium georgianum growing up on this ridge. Um, so we went and it was about a half a mile hike down this ridge and it's summer, so of course, what happens? We get a thunderstorm. So and we're up exposed and we had finally gotten to the plants and took some cuttings to bring back to juniper level. And then a big thunderclap hit 
you know, and the lightning was not very far away. So we ran that half mile back to the car, barely missing the downpour that followed. Uh, we brought, we rooted the cuttings, um, grew them in the garden. Tony and I were looking at them and said, wait, this isn't Georgiana. So I got in contact with Aaron Floden, who was at Tennessee at the time, now at Mobot, and worked with he and Tony and Brian Keener uh, to publish this. We thought it was going to be the same thing that Jim Allison had from Indian Grape Mountain in Georgia, but turns out this is actually a two-county endemic from Alabama around Talladega. It's called Podium Talladeganum, uh, which we published in 2020 as a new species. It's actually really neat. It was a great garden plant. Unfortunately, the plant on the right is no longer with us. Uh, I need to get more cuttings back from it, from Hayes. We got this really neat Amsonia rigida. Normally rigida is about three feet tall. Blue stars are something we grow a lot of at work. Adam Black found this population in Georgia and every plant was like less than two feet high. Uh, it's a dwarf population. It's It keys to Rigida. Uh, whether or not it really is Rigida it remains to be seen, but we are offering this for the first time this year. It's great <coughs> rock garden plant, average garden soil, great spring show of flowers and the foliage seems to hold up pretty well um, when others get rust. So in 2022, I spent a lot of time with Patrick McMillan doing a site inventory of this um, Sandridge habitat. Um, he had a contract to do a habitat here in Jasper County. This is um, Tillman Longleaf Sandridge habitat. It's a gopher tortoise habitat. It's one of the few places where it occurs in uh, South Carolina. Uh, this the only one we actually saw out of a burrow was when we took Tony down there. Um, and this one was crossing the road. Uh, I saw the tail end of a couple while we were down there. It's something, you know, reptiles have always been something I do also, but it was just amazing to see this tortoise. Uh, and we were looking at bean dips, not necessarily the, uh, the ones you eat, but these, these are little micro depressions in the sand ridge that their little micro topography, they, they drop about a, a foot or so from the surrounding sand ridge. They're loaded with lots of bean family members, uh, including one of the rare ones we were looking for, which was uh, Orbexilum lupinellum. It's, real, it's fairly common in the sand hills of North Carolina, not so much in South Carolina. It's difficult to see. Uh, in fact, the first population we found, Patrick had walked right on it. And I said, watch out, you're stepping on the plant. Patrick, you idiot. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, this huge population of it we found. It's beautiful in bloom. We found it to grow really well on, a, on our berms at Plant Delights. We're gonna try it from seed, um, but we collected some with permission um, during the, the study to at least have some genetics preserved from this site. It's, it's a preserve. It's about 1,400 acres of longleaf sand ridge. And we found, I don't know, six or 700 taxa on the site over the year. We were doing the inventory. This was another plant that was there that's performed admir admirably in the garden. This is Piraquata caroliniana. Carolina Piraquata. Um, the the inset is it in situ, and then we've we're growing it. This is in the alpine berm at juniper level. Uh, it seems to go in spells of flowering, where it will all the the buds will open at one time, and then it'll stop blooming for a day or two, and then bloom again. Um, but it's it's proven perennial. It hasn't seized around. It's been really great. Also there is a Waria cuneifolia, a Carolina Waria. This is a Brassica relative. Uh, it's a winter annual um, that looks sort of Cleome-esque in bloom, and it does these long um, follicles of seed, but fritillaries and zebra swallowtails seem to love it. Um, 
Also there, we were, one of the plants we were looking for is this uh, wary, uh, or the bulbous stylus wariae, wears hair sedge. Um, it's a listed species for South Carolina. Um, also named for where the, the waria was named after. It was just serendipitous that the two things named after the same person were growing side by side. It's actually most common in the sand roads on the property where there's constant disturbance. So, I mean, obviously this plant is not um, uncommon there. We also found um, Solidago brachyphylla, which is a very rare species for South Carolina. This was growing in the, in the laurel oak woodlands at the far end of the property. This is what it looked like in the wild, not very showy. We put it in the garden after a year and it, it rivals fireworks I think it's got nice little short foliage, uh, doesn't seem to want to run. It's, it gets about three feet tall, um, but it's, it was an amazing plant in the garden so far. We're gonna watch it and see what it does. Uh, Disarander odoratissima, Harper scrub balm is another plant that's only found in South Carolina here at the Sand Ridge. It's, this is a, winter, a late summer annual uh, it's it's common in Georgia, but uh, it's only in South Carolina in this one spot, barely in the the state. Um, it smells like cinnamon mint. It's got the strongest camphor odor of any Disarandra, and it's growing with uh, Trichostoma cetaceum, common blue curls, another short-lived uh, mint relative. We're growing this uh, Disarandra chrismanii, the Lake Wales balm, uh, at work. It's a single endemic, single county endemic uh, to Highlands County. I think the population is two by five kilometers of habitat that it occurs in. We got this from Bob McCartney from Woodlanders, who has every species of Disarandra practically on his property in Aiken, more than anywhere in Florida. It's amazing. Um, Patrick took me to some lime sink ponds in Berkeley County. This is in the Francis Marion. Uh, uh, there are two species of Burmania, which is a really weird monocot. Those are usually about three inches tall. It's sort of like the um, Obelaria and the impossible to grow, but really cute plants. Uh, they grow at, around the bases of all of these um, cypress on the drylands. But the reason we were at the lime sink was this was a population of Lindera melissifolia, pondberry. This is a spice bush cousin that gets about knee high and that's as big as it gets. It's um, very rare. Uh, that's, I mean, it, they're less than two feet and they're these little sort of scrubby looking little things, but they line the bay, the uh, lime sink there. But it was really neat to see a spice bush that wasn't the normal. Uh, also in the area was this Agalinus. Most of the species are annuals. This um, Agalinus linifolia is perennial. And actually we got a piece of it and it's growing in the bog at juniper level. Um, the carpenter bees seem to love it. It's, it's going on to its second season. It didn't bloom too much last year, but uh, we're hoping that it forms a bigger clump and does more of a show than a flower here and a flower there. But it's just amazing that there's a perennial one that's transplantable. Most of them are hemiparasitic on grasses. So Patrick McMillan introduced us to this Aringium ravenellii. Um, this is a really rare species from South Carolina related to Aringium aquaticum. We grow one uh, Charleston blues. Uh, the one on the left is uh, on the field road uh, in the Francis Marion uh, right off the highway. This is a new population we just found two years ago. Um, but it's got these amazing blue flowers. It's a very adaptable to cultivation, does not need to be wet, doesn't particularly need to have the calcareous um, substrate that it grows on in the wild. And pollinators go crazy for it, wasps and bees and all sorts of uh, flower beetles and just it's a pollinator magnet. Uh, this is one we got from Patrick when he was still at South Carolina. The Botanic Garden. This is uh, Lofiola aurea, Golden Crest. It's a really weird coastal plain endemic. Uh, it grows 
in Nova Scotia, New Jersey, Delaware, North Carolina, and then the Florida Panhandle through to Louisiana. It's great in a bog, um, but just got these amazing fuzzy white buds, and they're it's, it gets about mm, 18 inches high and doesn't seem to want to run. So it should be something good for introduction. Also at the same site that we saw the Eryngium is this non-running Lysimachia, Lysimachia hybrida or Steranema, as it's called now um, with the splitting of taxonomy. This is a great non-running um, summer it blooms for a long time in the summer um, a loose strife that we're trialing to see see how it does it's very limited in georgia or in south carolina and georgia but it's more common in the midwest so patrick took us to saint james church in santee parish which is this old church built in 1768 it was Amazing to walk to the graveyard and things. My former assistant Joe is standing at the base of this live oak. What's special about this site is it has green fly orchid covering the thing, the, the whole tree. Uh, it's normally a blackwater swamp species, but it is it must have been planted on the tree years ago, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, because there's no way it could cover the tree like it does. And then the plant on the left is, is at my house after 18 degrees, uh, there was a piece on the ground broken off the tree and it's gonna die, it's an epiphyte. So it's on a shepherd's hook at my house where it's attached itself and it's growing quite well. So this picture is from Wednesday on Spring Island, South Carolina. This is Trillium maculatum. A uh, friend of Patrick sent this to us, uh, but that's a lot of Trillium maculatum. I can only imagine how much banana that smells like because that's, it's an incredible plant. I just, that's just because I love Trilliums, I can't help myself. Also on some of the calcareous outcrops in South Carolina is this Elytraria carolinensis, Carolina scaly stem. This is a acanth relative. Um, it's evergreen rosette. It's got this little tiny spike of flowers. Uh, the deer bit our flower off at the garden last year, um, mm -hmm. but it's a rare, unusual, hard to, hard to find plant uh, from South Carolina. This was only recently found in South Carolina. This is Yatesia or Yatesia viridiflora. This one is from um, central Georgia, one of my collections, but another um, Ruilia type relative, but it's proven to be a fairly good garden plant uh, in our trials, despite growing in floodplain, it's doing well in average garden soil. So last spring, uh, I have uh, I was in Horry County, South Carolina, walking on a trail with some friends, and I saw this weird these leaves on this plant, and I was like, "What the heck is this? I've never it's you know looks like some sort of cystus type thing." I texted Patrick McMillan, and he said, "Oh my God." You found Crocanthemum nashii, what used to be Helianthemum nashii. Um, it was the second population that's been found in South Carolina. It's normally Florida, a Florida native, but this is one of the largest populations of it in South Carolina. Um, but it's just, you know, you go out in your backyard and you can find just all kinds of weird stuff. So I got in touch with the state botanist of South Carolina and monitored, have, sent him coordinates of all the meta populations there of this really interesting plant. I didn't catch it in bloom, unfortunately. They're yellow, um, little small sunrose type flowers, but it grows in these open sandy flatwoods. Uh, Asclepias lanceolata. This is um, one of the swamp milkweeds. It grows in sort of ditches and stuff. This is in Francis Marion. We're growing seedlings from this. Uh, this We saw this in June and July, and when we took Tony back in September, they were luckily in fruit, so we have these in the garden at work. Uh, there were some crossing with uh, uh, Sclepias rubra, so there were some purple ones in there too. Unfortunately, this one does not run. Well, or fortunately it doesn't run, but unfortunately it makes it hard to 
propagate because it's you get a single stem and that's it. So we're working to get numbers built on this because this is a great native milkweed. It gets about three feet high. Uh, and then a plant that was native not too far down the road here when there was a method, when Method Road had the method bog on it, um, this would have been native. Tony, you said it was native on the the state fairground property when you were there. Uh, so it, this was this was around here. This is uh, Lillian Kate's bi. These are from Pender County um, at um, Holly Shelter. Um, a weirdo on the left who decide, couldn't decide if it was one flower or two. Um, but this is a great lily. Um, blooms in late summer, early fall. Um, grows with saracenias and things. Uh, and also grows with Dianea as well. They, these are um, from a trip that I went with Cindy and Tim to the Croatan uh, right when COVID was starting to hit. But some nice red forms and some nice yellow forms of the Venus flytrap. North Carolina's well-known endemic or near, near endemic. Uh, and you never know who you're going to see. Um, when you're out in the field or who you're going to take in the field, actually. It's Dan Hinckley taking pictures of Dianea at the Green Swamp. Uh, I took he and Adam Black and um, John, oh, John from State. Um, um, yeah, I, he's going to hate me for that. Um, also down there was Drosera intermedia and Drosera brevifolia, some of the sundews, as well as... Um, utricularia that grow in these coastal plain bogs. And also uh, our three native butterworts, uh, Pinguicula cerulea on the left, uh, Ludia on the middle, and Pumula on the right. We saw these with Cindy and Tim when we were down at the Croatan as well. Really great little native spring flowering carnivore plant, carnivorous plants. Uh, Patrick took us to these Saracenia flava populations down in Francis Mary, and this is um, a population on a logging deck. Uh, after Hugo hit in '89, they had to come in and log a lot of the the down trees uh, because the Francis Marion took a direct hit when Hugo hit and knocked a lot of trees down before making its way to Charlotte. Um, and this was scraped to the ground after they piled the logs up in 1990 or 91. So some of these clones are 30 plus years old, uh, never touched. Some of them are 20 feet across, single clones. Obviously there's not, a, not too many of them here in these <laughs> populations, um, but it, it was just, I stood there with my mouth open and said, oh my God, about a billion times. So I'll, this is it a little bit later in the year when the uh, Rhincospora latifolia and the Iriacolon decangulari were blooming. Um, we're growing both of these at juniper level in a bog. Um, normally we're growing Rhincospora colorata, used to be Dichromena, um, but this um, latifolia is about three feet tall with long bracts and it doesn't run like the other species, um, we're going to try it from seed. It's a really, really well-behaved plant in the area call on. We only wish that it would take over because it's so ridiculously cool. This is uh, Red Bluff Bay. It's a clay-based bay, but it has some really nice um, red forms of Saracenia um, at Flava atropuria. So this is it from, from the air. Um, you can see it's a Carolina Bay. They're nice and oval and odd. Uh, this one is covered in Rhincospora tracei and Saracenias. This is a really neat um, depression meadow. It, the, the water table is perched above the ground. It's, it was soppy wet, but it's just an amazing sight that Patrick took us to. Uh, thank you for coming. Any questions? Huh? No, I didn't take John. John okay. I took uh, Adam and Dan and uh, John Nix. That was the name I couldn't remember when I uh, had a little brain thing. Yeah.
Yes. They asked how, how the Pakistander was different than the uh, Angola form that we grow at juniper level. Um, uh, it's, uh, we'll let you know. Okay. It's, it, it would be a probably, I, I would say it would take at least as much heat as Angola, but Angola obviously is from Louisiana, so it's really heat tolerant. It gets a little warm in upstate South Carolina, but I mean, there there were lots of variations. We took some cuttings and divisions off of some of those to, so to see. Different. Yeah, no, it definitely, the, the winter color is absolutely phenomenal with the silvers on the leaves. So orchid, oh yes. Yes, the uh, the orchid I showed, the green fly orchid, it is in North Carolina, um, like Columbus County and down near Wilmington, but it's basically a swamp forest. It grows on the Northeast Cape Fear and some of the taxodium and things there. It's it's more common in Florida and the further south you go, but it, it seems to be at least a zone eight, if not a zone seven epiphytic orchid. We've killed it once before at work, but... This one, this one took 14 in uh, the winter of 22 at my house and sailed through without issue. You're, you're not doing anything. It comes from a swamp habitat. Yeah, no, I'm just, it's sitting on a shepherd's hook in my front yard or up against the house. I mean, it's not up against, the, it's, it's fairly close to the house, but it's got some canopy, but it's attached itself quite easily and readily to to the metal because it won't just attach. So, okay, have I seen the uh, Eurybia avita at Boggs Rock? Yes, we have. Uh, we did not see it in flower. Uh, for taxonomy, do I use chlor? Do we use chloroplast DNA sequencing? Uh, for some of it, yes, we do, but we generally base it off of research papers and things that, you know, we have a lot of friends and we read a lot of papers, so. Okay, are we growing Travateria fonta calcarea? We've tried it. Uh, we went to go see it with Aaron Floden or one of the other ones that he just re fairly recently published in the past decade. It did not like Raleigh, so. Oh, Method Bo it was on Method Road somewhere. I don't know exactly. There's lots of old specimens. Um, it's obviously somewhere here near the Arboretum because Method's right over there. Um, it had Saracenias. It had a bunch of coastal plain plants on it, but you know, progress, right? Greenhouses. Yes, greenhouses and homes and road. I don't, it's, yeah, there's so many habitats I've been to in my experience in the past 30 years of botanizing and doing rescues, like with Tom Harville and things that, there's these sites that I can remember that are gone, so. So Jasper County is as far south as you can go in South Carolina without hitting Savannah. So it's the farthest tip of South Carolina. It took us about five and a half hours to drive do it from going down 95. At, so it's coastal plain? It's coastal plain. Um, it's a little bit upland. Um, the site, it's it, it's uh, directly adjacent to the Savannah River. So there were flooded um, forest as well, uh, taxodium, uh, southern cottonwood. Uh, it Really interesting flood plain forest, uh, bluff oak there, Quercus australis. Corcus austrina was one of the plants we were monitoring for. Um, and we never actually got to go too deep into the flooded forest. The time we were supposed to go down with uh, the state botanist with a boat to survey the creek bank, we had a hurricane come through that flooded out the savanna, and it was not a time we were going to get to go see but it's it was a really neat project to be involved with. Um, inventorying 1,400 acres is quite uh, a daunting challenge, but um, we got it done, so. Oh, yes, uh, probably uh, fungus gnats, small flies. Um, oh, yeah, what, what pollinates the uh, sarums? Um, it's generally small, insects that like 
fungal type odors that that will pollinate that sort of thing. I'm not sure that there's much known about pollinator biology of Asarums or Hexastylus, but that's it's about like trying to figure out what pollinates Aspidistras. They say slugs, and it's, no, slugs eat the flowers. <laughs> so, uh, no, do I have any trips coming up? Not currently. Um, I went to the Bay Area in October and was completely amazed with with all the West Coast flora. I'd like to get back out there at some point to see um, the Western trilliums and see some of the trout lilies and stuff that are out there and just experience and see Ber UC Berkeley's Botanic Garden and see the South African flora in bloom. Um, I know that there's a meeting coming up here shortly, plug for that, um, but it, Berkeley and, you know, the San Francisco Botanic Garden at Golden Gate Park, Muir Woods, I can't say enough good things about seeing some of the places in San Francisco and the food is amazing and the <laughs> bakeries are amazing. Every, I mean, everything, the Bay Area, if you can stand the traffic, it's well worth going to see. Thank you. Thank you.